Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Navigating History podcast. Uh, this is Season 1, Episode 6. Uh, it's going to be on the Battle of the, of the Hedaspis River. Uh, I'm your host, Andrew, as always. And uh, for this week's episode, we're going to do something a little bit different than we've been doing the last uh, last five episodes. Um Obviously, I try and keep these episodes very sort of factual and very, you know, okay, this is this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, you know, sort of very informative. And of course, this episode will still be that way of uh, as well. But this episode will also have a little bit of a uh, could devolve into a little bit of a rant uh, because of uh, some of the things that happen in history and something that I think goes overlooked a little bit in ancient history. And uh, I'm going to put a little bit of respect on uh the name of someone who I think gets a little bit overlooked and a little bit overshadowed throughout history, uh, especially um, especially in in the the areas that I've you know studied and in military history as well. You know, a, a lot of this person's achievements go towards um, go towards somebody else, and as you'll see when we get into the, the this episode, you'll you'll know who, who I'm talking about and. Uh, I'll mention it when I get off the top, but I'll try and stay sort of on track uh, as well. Anyway, so for this week, uh, we're going to cover the Battle of H- the Hedaspis River and everything that uh, you know led up to it. So uh, last last week, uh, as of course, if you haven't seen last week's episode, go go watch it. It's up on YouTube at Navigating History and follow at Navigating History on Instagram and on and on TikTok at. Uh, navigating underscore history so if you haven't uh if, if you haven't seen it just search it up it's on youtube at navigating history on youtube give you know don't forget to like and subscribe and um anyway if you haven't seen the previous episodes they're all there uh this is the first video of mine you've watched uh hi i'm andrew uh anyway uh getting right into this uh i'm as i'm assuming um You've watched the other videos before this one. If you haven't, stop this video now. Go watch the other uh, five videos in the season, and we can, you know, we'll go from there, and then come back and rejoin this episode. <clears throat> so for this episode, we sort of have um, a lot of stuff to get through. A lot of stuff happens because the Battle of the Hedaspis River takes place several years uh, after uh, after uh, what happened in last week's episode happens, right? Um, so let, just just sort of to recap uh, here, right? The Battle of the Jixartes, um, you know, took place uh, took place a couple years ago uh, in 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 the historical timeline, and this place this takes place in 326 uh, BCE. So this battle takes place f- almost four full years after what has happened uh, with with uh, with the Battle of the, J- the Jixartes. So a little bit of recap from last week. Of course, Alexander uh, has defeated Darius, um, although he was. And, and defeated, and now is the undisputed king of Persia. Um, you know, initially Darius was killed by Bessus, um, one of his, uh, one of his, you know, sub- subordinates, one of his, his uh, lords had sort of killed him and tried to take his throne, uh, and then uh, tried to attack Alexander. Didn't go well, um, and then Alexander uh, has sort of um, taken over, and he he's been a year, uh, you know, the year of three twenty nine uh, BCE, sort of like. Um, making sure that everything was secure in in the Persian Empire, making sure that all of the, making sure that everything was secure. His borders were secure. There were no sort of basically there was no threat of rebellion. And once that had been done, right, his uh, all of his soldiers were kind of you know thinking, all right, we've done our job here. We do, we've do, we've done what we've set out to do. We we kind of want to go home, right? They're thinking, you know, our we set out on this war to. Um, we set out on this war to very, you know, to, 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 to get back at the Persians who, uh, and to sort of, and to liberate the, as, as I mentioned in, in week one, again, if you haven't seen it, go check it out. Week one, uh, you know, the first episode of the season, uh, the inaugural episode of this podcast, if you haven't seen it, go check it out. Um, as I mentioned, Alexander, the, you know, the guys for this war, other than Alexander one is, you know, uh, you know, bloodthirsty conqueror pretty much, uh, was that he wanted to liberate the Greeks living under Persian rule. And then they'd done that. And, you know, Alexander was now the dis- undisputed ruler of, of Persia, right? There were no, there was no dispute. There was no, right. There was nobody else who would dare challenge his throne. He was, he was fully in control of the situation here. And that's, and, and, and a lot of the soldiers were thinking, right, until Darius had been captured, they were sort of thinking, all right, like, okay, this is going to be, like, okay, we're going to, and once Darius is captured and we've con- secured control, we'll be able to go home, right? 
um, this had been five years now since they had crossed the Hellespont River and into Persia and had, had attacked the Persians uh, five years since this war had started. And they were tired. They were tired. They missed their homes. They missed their their, their families back home. They missed, they missed being, you know, in Greek, uh, in Greece. And Alexander, uh, during these five years, had also changed quite a bit. He had uh, taken on a lot of the uh, Persian customs as well and surrounded himself more and more with almost exclusively Persian uh, advisors, like he was planning on... He himself was planning on staying in Persia long term rather than, you know, ruling over a large swath of empire from Macedon. If that makes sense. Like, so instead of making Macedon his capital, he, um, he, um, actually, you know, planned on, on staying in Persia. And this angered a lot of the Greek, uh, soldiers, right? This angered a lot of Greeks, uh, because they were, you know, he was Greek and, they were thinking first and foremost that he would be supportive of the of the Greeks, and that he would you know y yes we were trying to conquer new land but also we we're Greek right and he would eventually return home to Greece and it didn't look like he had any intention of returning home, uh, or at, at least anytime soon. Uh, and part of this was and so this was showing division in the in the Macedonian ranks right and his army was very. Um, there, 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 you know, there was no shortage of outspokenness towards this uh, idea that they wanted to be, that they, you know, the war was over, let's go home, kind of, the, the war was over, let's go home kind of mentality, right? So this sort of, you know, this sort of um, caused, like I said, this caused a lot of tension uh, within within the Greek ranks. And part of, part of that, um, and, and and part of that came when Alexander actually did and end up launching a new campaign into India and wanted to and talk and talk about launching a new campaign into India and then wanting to launch the new campaign from Bactria into India, um, as uh, you know and Alexander was acting very anti Greek, right? Uh, this is one of those wars where. Uh, sometimes in history there there I I, I don't like there's some like. Uh, the some army tries to have some uh, sort of reason for why they're going to war other than just, I want to be the king of everything, right? Um, the Romans, uh, you know, with the Cassus Belly, and I keep mentioning the Romans. Uh, I think my next season is going to be on the Romans, but uh, again, there will be a post uh, on the Instagram that you can vote, and the, the most liked vote will, uh, the, the highest, uh, the vote will, uh, that, you know, the one you guys vote for will be the one that I choose. So, but the Romans will, something Roman will definitely be one of the options for sure. Um, anyway, uh, sorry, go going off a bit of a tangent, but the Romans are basic. The Romans always had a casus belli, which is sort of a legal reason for going to war. And nobody did this better than Caesar, right? Caesar was a bloodthirsty conqueror um, himself, but he always sort of... Um, framed his his wars as somewhat defensive i.e this agreement was done against the, the roman state so therefore now we have a responsibility to um you know defend our state and to sort of like defend our the honor of our, our honor of our nation and attack and win right whereas the the alexander's campaign against the Indi the um you know uh, the indian state uh, like the on the Indi his campaign on the Indian subcontinent, very much didn't have any sort of um, any sort of plan, or what I mean, or not plan, but any sort of like uh, you know justification, right? Other than Alexander wanted to be, he wanted to conquer. He he had an insatiable lust for conquest, right? He had a need. It was primal to him was I need to be better than everybody. I need to be in charge of everything. I need to be conqueror. I need to be the conqueror of everything. And this was something that went against everything that, that you know, this is something that, that had angered a lot of Greeks because again, this meant that there was a longer campaign, another, another few years. They didn't know how long this would take. They didn't know how far it would go and how much, and right. And that's part of the thing is Alexander was very, Right, he he sort of had he never he didn't really have this idea of settling down and staying somewhere. Um, he just wanted to go and fight and win, right? And he had this, and I'll get into this in a later episode in the season on Alexander. Um, 
But he had at one point, and I'll go into more detail later, but he had at one point visited the Oracle of Delphi. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the Oracle of Delphi was this, uh, basically this, uh, you know, soothsayer type, uh, but like super powerful, said to be the voice of the, the uh, Greek gods. And basically, uh, eventually the, the prophecy said that Alexander would not be killed, could not be killed. And Alexander had this um, idea that he was almost invincible. Right, and, and he was playing off of that. And he, he, one of the other things that really angered his soldiers was when he, during this Persian campaign, he changed from sort of being like an everyday Greek king. Uh, yes, a king, but, you know, still having this, still being grounded uh, in reality and in the, like, you know, common, in the common, uh, like, plights of his men right being grounded with them he sort of demanded godlike tributes and godlike treatment from his soldiers and from servants and from just regular citizens of of the empire now and this angered a lot of people so much so that there were assassination attempts levied against alexander um in the th in the late 320s so in 328 329 uh, 327, uh, you know, 328, 329 BCE, there were several assassination attempts. In fact, and, um, there was a lot of tension, as I mentioned. And, um, actually at one point, Alexander, um, Alexander was nearly killed. Um, and, and he, uh, he, he believed that Philotus, one of his commanders was responsible for this. Now, Philotus himself, um, there was no evidence for this. There was very little evidence to support that Philotus was any had any involvement with any sort of conspiracy. But Alexander became extremely paranoid during this time. Right? Again, he he sensed the tension in his men. He sensed the tension that was that that his army was dealing with, and he became extremely paranoid. He began to believe that you know everyone was out to try and kill him, and everyone was trying to to, to dethrone him and try to take over. And uh, Philotus was the was the son of Parmenion, was the firstborn son of Parmenion, Alexander and um, Alexander's most experienced general and, and most, you know, second in command. So, uh, so um, Parmenion stood to benefit the most from Alexander's, um, from Alexander's death. In fact, Alexander at this time did not have um, a fully recognized, uh, like, either teen or adult heir uh, obviously he was you know he was still a young-ish man by this uh, by this by this point in his life uh so he obviously hadn't his he, you know didn't i can't remember i i haven't found whether or not he did actually have a son at this point uh in his life uh or or a daughter even like he didn't have a child at this point as far as i know um that could have been the case i, I honestly haven't uh, seen that but um e even so there was you know, there would have been a power vacuum had he been dethroned, um, had he been assassinated and, and killed. So Alexander became extremely paranoid to the point where he um, imprisoned and then executed Philotas, uh, Philotas with very little evidence. Very, very sort of like, oh, he was in, the, like, you know, like, oh, he was in the same place as the guy. and da, da, Like, very sort of circumstantial, non, not real evidence, no hard evidence, no, uh, and obviously this is way before, you know, the... the you know the technology of today so they obviously wouldn't have had dna they wouldn't have it. but there was no um like there was nothing tying um Philotus to the conspiracy but alexander believed it so he did uh, so he tied him to it and then he killed him uh and obviously this meant that parminian had to be killed obviously if you're going to kill the guy's son um you have to kill him too otherwise he's you know going to fight back and again this was this was and this is where I'm going to go off on a little bit of a rant here. Uh, this was one of the stupidest things Alexander could have literally ever done in his entire life. Alexander only lived to be 32 years old. This was one of the dumbest things he's ever done. Um, because obviously, like killing Parminian, you have to. Like, yes, once you've killed his son, you have to, because Parminian loved his son and would do anything to sort of defend the guy, right? And you're like, you know, imagine, imagine, right? I'm sure many of you out there watching, you have a boss, right? Um, or you have uh, somebody that you work with closely uh, in some capacity, right? Imagine if your boss just sort of showed up and was like, hey, your son tried to, tried to, you know, d you know, steal something from me or kill me. Uh, and you went, uh, no, and he went, 
uh, no, I didn't. Right. Your boss is your kid was like, no, I didn't do it. I wasn't involved. Like, I'm sorry this happened to you. I wasn't anywhere near this when this happened. And he's like, no, no, you did it. You did it. You absolutely did. And then killed and then like either, you know, killed the guy. Right. Or not necessarily killed the guy. But, you know, like there were serious repercussions and or like, you know, press charges against the guy. Right? You would not be very happy with your boss for pressing charges against your family member without evidence, without evidence. I'm, I'm sure most of you are reasonable people out there listening to this, where if there was evidence and the, the person actually had committed a crime, you would be like, okay, well, yes, you, you could still love them. But of course, the, you know, uh, you would understand like, okay, yes, the crime has been committed. We need to do something about this. You deserve to be, you know, tried and then uh, punished in whatever de- uh, way the court deems, uh, you know, acceptable, right? And I'm sure... In Parminian's case, I'm sure that had there been uh, any sort of evidence against his son, right? Had his son actually tried to do this, I'm I'm based on my own research. I'm pretty damn sure that Parminian would have sided with Alexander. He would have cast out his son. But the fact that there was no evidence for this, the fact that Alexander just sort of, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna just do this, and this is what I believe, and there's right. He, you know, he, again, he was a king. He was, you know, the higher authority. So, of course, you know, the people had to carry this out. But, it, you know, it, it didn't, A, it doesn't it doesn't look good for his army. Um, and B, now you've lost your most senior military commander and your most your most experienced, your most senior military, military commander and your, your closest, the closest thing you have to, like, you know, like if, if if you weren't around or you weren't able to be there, like you know that you the, this whole thing would have fallen apart. Um, Parminian was Parminian was uh, like one of is one of the most underrated uh, figures in all of ancient history, in my personal opinion. Right, man was born in so just a little. I'm gonna go off on a little aside here on Parminian for a few minutes, and then we'll get back to what happens after this uh, with Alexander. But Parminian. Herminian deserves some respect, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little bit do a little section in this podcast dedicated to him because he's one of my favorite character. Uh, fa- I say characters, but favorite um, you know historical figures that doesn't get a lot of uh, praise and a lot of uh, shine. Really, sort of just is thrown in as Alexander, one of Alexander's commanders, and not doesn't really get the credit for what he genuinely achieved. Um, so Parminian was born in 400 uh, BCE, and at this point in time. Macedon was nowhere near as powerful as it eventually became, right? At, at its peak, it was you know one of the one of the states in in the, you know in Greece, you know, with Athens and Sparta, Thebes, you know, right? It was there, but it was sort of considered a backwater on the edges of civilized of the civilized world, according to most Greeks, right? They didn't see it as this triumphant leader of the Hellenic League that it was eventually turned into. And Parminian played a, a key role in the development of Macedonian power, right? Not only was he a close personal friend of the king, Philip II, who also des- deserves a lot of credit for making Mac- Macedon powerful, for re- completely revamping the army under Parminian. Parminian is the one uh, who trained the soldiers, who helped come up with battle plans, who was, was there with... Philip, you know, leading battles, and in fact, in some cases, led battles on Philip's behalf when Philip was had to be somewhere else or was on a was fighting on a different front. He became Philip's second in command. Philip is obviously Alexander's father. Uh, father, for those of you who haven't seen any of the earlier episodes in this series, um, but Philip was Alexander's father, so he was a key personal, not only just a key figure in Alexander's father's Alexander uh, Alexander's father Philip's reign, but also a personal friend of of Philip, right? And obviously, they grew close. They worked together for, for years and years. And Parminian was key in Alexander gaining control of, of Macedon after Philip's death, right? Because there was a little bit of a power vacuum, right? Alexander had was 16 at the time. And they, they weren't really sure, right? Weren't really sure whether he was going to be a good king, whether or not he was ready, whether or not he was mature enough, right? And there were a lot of, um, you know, Macedonian nobles who were sort of vying for power and control and influence. And Parminian was like, no, 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 no. We're backing this guy. And then a lot of other, a lot of 
the, the military fell in line behind him because he was such a, you know, um, because he was such a, like a prestigious military commander and, and prestigious and loyal military commander. And he, you know, he really sort of helped Alexander gain control of the Macedon and prove himself. He was a sort of a stabilizing influence for the Macedonian Empire uh, during that time in between Alexander's full control over Macedon and, and Philip's death. Um, or from the time of Philip's death to Alexander's full control, I should say. Uh, but he was very in important to the Macedonian people, not just, um, you know, the military, but the people saw him as this, again, this stabilizing influence. And he, he always did what Alexander told him to do, even when he disagreed with the battle plan. For example, if we take, if we go back to the battle of the Granicus river, right? He was like, he was the one who was suggested according to historical sources. Of course, he's the one who suggested that Alexander should wait and see if the uh, Persians pulled back. And he's the one who suggested that possibly it might be a good idea for the Persians to, to, you know, to rest after March day's March. Obviously, Alexander sort of ignored his advice, but he was giving solid advice to Alexander. He was always loyal, and he was always looking out for his men, and he was always looking out for Alexander, too. He was, you know, he was very, very loyal to the men. He would, he basically did everything that Alexander told him to do. In fact, the Battle of Guagamela was really Parmenian's shining moment. Because their battle plan at, at Guagamela was, hey, Parmenian's going to take on the brunt of the force and sort of get surrounded and you're going to have to hold off until I can so basically surprise attack the Persians. That was their battle plan, right? If, if you haven't seen the video on the Battle of Guagamela, uh, it's up on YouTube and on Spotify if you haven't, uh, uh, for listing purposes there. Um, so if you haven't seen it, then go check it out. But seriously, Parmenium got himself basically surrounded by Persian forces and severely outnumbered and trusted Alexander and Alexander basically said, you're going to wait here and you're going to take the brunt of the force and you're going to be the, you know, be the, the you're going to be the decoy, right? You're going to be the, the person that they attack so that I can do, I can defeat them. And for me, he went, okay, sure, right? He put himself in an extremely dangerous position just so Alexander could win. He was an extremely loyal commander. In fact, he was very, uh, you know, he was at a different, even a different part of um, Bactria at the time, um, dealing with supply lines and logistics. Uh, something that Alexander, ob as I mentioned, I've mentioned before in previous, um, in my previous videos, that Alexander paid a lot of attention to was the logistics of running and maintaining his army. Um, so Parmenian, he put Parmenian in charge of this initially. Uh, now, sorry, we're, we're back away from the Parmenian's, Parmenian's timeline and back into the timeline. So this is back in the 320s uh, um, BCE, um, back in Bactria after um, the Persian Empire has been secured. Um, this, so Parmenian is dealing with the supply lines and logistics and stuff. And Alexander sends assassins after him, and they kill him. And Parmenian is genuinely surprised. He, I'm I, at this point, he's extremely surprised because I'm not even sure he knows that his son has died. Um, again, I couldn't find reports on, as to whether or not he knew that his son had passed away, uh, had been had been killed by Alexander. But he was certainly surprised to see this, um, and never and and there was and there was no evidence to suggest that he ever betrayed Alexander. Uh, despite the fact that it probably would have been in his best interests to do so. And had he wanted to, he could have, with all the tension that was surrounding the Macedonian force at this time. He was one of the most influential Macedonian figures, and he always gets overlooked. So I just wanted to take a, a few minutes here out of this podcast to give him some love, because... He's one of the greatest military. He's probably one of the greatest military minds of the ancient world, and he's never talked about in that in that um, realm with Julius Caesar and Marcus Agrippa and Alexander the Great, and even Philip II. So he was he was right up. He's right up there in that in one of those in 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 the conversation for greatest tactical minds, or at least he should be in my opinion. And I wanted to give him a, a little bit of love on this podcast because. He's, you know, he's one of the, the most underrated historical figures, in my opinion. But unfortunately, of course, he dies. And this sort of, 
the re- the realization that Alexander could even do this to his most trusted and most loyal commander sort of quells for the time being uh, a little bit of the the tension within the Macedonian camp. And Alexander launches his new campaign into India, uh, and this is one of the this is one of the campaigns that, like I mentioned, doesn't have any. Honestly, it doesn't make sense why, other than Alexander's greed and Alexander's need for conquest, uh, nothing else. Nothing about this campaign really makes sense. Right, the gains did not significantly outweigh the risks of crossing into uh, India uh, and with like, you know. With their their months, with like the, the the weather and the heat and the, the the you know the long supply lines they'd have to have from from Persia through the mountains, right? Everything that everything that was going on with this seems like a hey we don't and also there was no need there was no reason there was no, um, right there was no, there, it made it made no sense because even if we go back um, to the Battle of the Granicus River and Alexander invading Persia. The Persians and the Greeks had been at war for 150 years. In fact, Alexander, um, when he took over the capital city of Persepolis, he burned it to the ground in retribution uh, for the Persians burning Greek cities over 150 years prior. So the Persians and the Greeks had long been um, long been ancient enemies, including um, the, you know obviously if, if you've seen uh, 300, uh, right? So it wasn't it wasn't even just the Macedonians that wanted to. Um, to, to, to fight against the Persians, you know, the Spartans, the Athenians, uh, as well, you know, made every major state in, in Greece had a problem with the Persians. Whereas, you know, in, in the, on the Indian subcontinent, there, were, there wasn't any reason for this, right? Persia had been secured. The Persian empire was now under fir- firmly under Greek control. Persia had been, you know, P- Persian power had been neutralized, Right. But Alexander, again, has this insatiable need, and it was desire to be to, to conquer things, to conquer people. So he, in fact, he he crossed uh, into the, onto the Indian subcontinent, and instantly sort of uh, encountered a a, a a group of people called the Taxila. And the first thing he did is, does when he encounters them was, "Hey, you're gonna you're gonna surrender to me." I am your new king now. He went up to the Texelan king and basically said, "I'm the king now." Right? Kind of like that uh, if any of you if any of you have seen Captain Phillips the the movie by the way if you haven't seen it check it out. It's pretty good. Uh, not a sponsor or not a like no paid promotion there obviously. Just just a room, movie recommendation. Uh, but you know the kind the line where he goes, "I am the captain now." And he walks up, he goes to, you know, the, the Captain Phillips and says, "I am the captain now." Alexander walks up to this guy and basically goes, "I'm the king now. You're gonna, you're gonna surrender to me," and expected it. He wasn't. It wasn't like they had. They never like you know. I I'm not even sure if I'm sure the Indi- the the uh, Texelan people had heard of, um, had heard of the, the Macedonians conquer of Persia because obviously they were right on the Persian border, and of course I'm sure they'd heard rumors and things, but. They never. They had no qual, uh, quarrel with Alexander, right? So it didn't make sense as to why. You know, obviously it made sense in terms of like Alexander wanted to conquer them, but just straight up like they were, they weren't expecting it, right? It wasn't. There was no preamble to this conflict other than Alexander going, "I want that," and I'm pointing off screen, but Alexander going, "I want that," and then deciding to take it. And he expected, and many many of the. The, the chieftains of the uh, tribes in this area did uh, bend the knee to Alexander, but but there was one uh, person who didn't. Um, his uh, King Porus of the Peruvians was very much a you know he was he was a powerful leader within the region and had a significant force um, at the time. You know, roughly in the in roughly forty thousand, um, you know. 40,000 uh, soldiers at this point and had a decent army and, and, and also had a relatively secure border with the, the Hadaspes river uh, being right there, right? His, his lands, his, his, um, I'll, I'll say his uh, area of control was very well defended with the Hadaspes river being right there. And so he decided, uh, no, I am not going to bend the knee to Alexander. Um, you're going to have to fight me. And I think I can win. Um, right. And sort of, and sort of just, instead of just bending the knee without, 
um, a fight, he he basically declared war on the invaders and said, "Hey, I'm going to fight back," and this galvanized his people. And um, Porus uh, was was like an excellent military commander and fearsome warrior in his own right. You know, he stood at he was over he was almost eight feet tall. He was huge. He was. He t- he would he would have towered over pretty much everybody today. In fact, he probably would have been like a superstar in the NBA uh, if if he lived in in today's world. But uh, uh, definitely would have played center, uh, possibly. Uh, it would have, you know he would have been he would have been awesome. Uh, it actually would have been funny to it'd be funny to see him going up against LeBron James and in, in uh, but he, but again, obviously <laughs> it's not possible. But it would, you know, historical matchup who who would win for us or LeBron James? But uh, uh, you know, I can only dream about that. <laughs> anyway, uh, he was very much a, you know, again, a, one a galvanizing factor for the for the, the 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 tribes in this area, and they were able to band together against Alexander. Furthermore, he thought he had more time than he actually did, uh, with it being May of three twenty six BCE. So Alexander had crossed into. Um, Onto over the mountains and into the Indian subcontinent uh, in late 327. So, the, and by the time he had sort of secured a, a, a foothold in the area, and the you know sent word to these tribes, and a lot of the tribes had surrendered to him. A lot of the, the you know the, the chieftains had surrendered to him at this point. He, uh, it, you know, it was turning into you know spring of. Um, 3, 326 BCE, uh, so April May. Uh, so it was May at this point, and you know it was. With you know snows from the from the Himalayas and it was approaching monsoon season, so Porus is thinking, all right. He's also on the border of his lands, near right across the river, so he's been camped there for a while, expecting because obviously he refused Alexander's um, refused Alexander's summons to sort of bend the knee to him. Excuse me. He's expecting Alexander to try and attack. So he's, you know, blocking off the crossing to the river. He's been there for a while. So when Alexander arrives, he sees the, uh, in the um, he sees Porus and the Peruvians there and says, okay, I get it. This isn't, like, and sees that he's, he's, um, he's got a significant force. Like I said, it's in the 40s, it's in the 40s in terms of uh, thousands of men. It's, it's, it's an extremely significant force. And Alexander, Alexander sort of realizes a direct crossing, um, like at Granicus, uh, would not work here, right? It is approaching monsoon season um, in the area, which it's incredibly storm, incredible storms to just like there's you're you're not gonna you're not if you try and cross you're going to lose most of your army and then you're gonna lose the fight anyway. So Alexander is looking for a way across the river, in fact, and and he finds one um, thirty kilometers, thirty thirty kilometers up river, he finds a crossing. And he, and during a, a stormy night, because this is how ballsy this guy was, he just decided, all right, screw it. We're going to, we're going to cross, right? He, he knew that he had a, a sort of a time limit, right? Uh, but during a stormy night, he goes, all right, I don't expect the, you know, the, per, the Peruvians to, um, and I might be mispronouncing the name of that tribe. Uh, so I do apologize. Uh, per, the Peruvians to, to sort of see what we're doing here. So we're going to cross now. And it, again, Alexander... Alexander gets insanely lucky throughout history. Uh, and you have to be lucky to be good and good to be lucky, or so the saying goes anyway. But he just gets extremely lucky, right? Most of his army is able to uh, make the crossing safely. Uh, at least part of his army is able to make the crossing safely enough that it's a significant force. Um, and so Porus hears about this. King Porus hears about this and is like, No. No way. They, there's no way this could happen. Like he doesn't believe that it's real because, of course, what idiot would cross during a freaking storm in the middle of the night in a territory you don't know that you haven't really scouted that well? You haven't scouted the other side of the river. You like it's, it, again. He's like, "What the hell? This is stupid, right?" He, he you know he he almost dismisses it, but he's like, "All right, well, fine. I'll go send people to check it out." So he sends his son in command of two thousand men to go and check this out. And lo and behold, Alexander, of course, being the absolutely brazen, sometimes foolish king that he is, thinks he's invincible, so he just crosses the river, is like, ah, psh, I made it, cool, whatever, we're here. Um, and and sort of like, 
at, you know, realize, and the, 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 the uh, Peruvians realize, oh, shoot, we've got guys on the side of the river who are going, that, you know, the, the, the Macedonians are now on this side of the river and they're going to come towards us. Uh, unfortunately, the king's son does eventually die in this battle. But uh, scouts get sent back to his father so that Porus now knows that the Macedonians are on the same side of the river as them. And Porus advances uh, quickly to attack them. Uh, in order to stop all of the Macedonians from crossing. In fact, he does this. He's able to stop most of the Macedonians from crossing, which means that at this battle, his force actually outnumbers the Macedonian force. Um, he, um, you know, he, he outnumbered the Macedonian force, including over ha having over 100 war elephants. Uh, but before we get into the exact, uh, you know, pl uh, how how the battle itself played out. I just want to take a second and talk about how much Alexander had changed in the last five years, because uh, when they were crossing um, the, the mountain range into onto the Indian subcontinent, Alexander just didn't care that his men were going to die. He was like, oh, "Loss of life and doesn't matter." And da 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 da. And like I'm, he was reckless with human life, which is something he had not been before. Um, and again, this is part of the reason why his, uh, his initially his men were so loyal to him is because he always won and he always did his best to make sure that his men were in the best possible situation. They were the best equipped, they were the best trained, they were, right, they were as safe as possible while doing everything. Uh, while he was somewhat reckless himself, but his men trusted him because they knew that he would keep them safe. Where in this case, he it started to become reckless with his the lives of his men, which, again, can rub people the wrong way. When you realize that this person doesn't care about you, you stop caring about them and stop being as loyal to them as maybe you maybe you would be otherwise. Uh, otherwise. Uh, and it really sort of, you know, it really, it, again, it really sort of marks a change for Alexander from this, like, you know, revered figure in in amongst the greeks uh to this like just this power hungry warlord right uh, and that's what he was uh, but back to this particular battle here he sort of alexander realizes okay we're outnumbered what are we going to do right and um alexander has picked up a lot of different uh, tactics and a lot of different units from all over his now conquered lands, including Scythian horse archers. So his first uh, foray into this battle was to send um, the Scythian horse archers forward. Uh, you know, Scythian were part of the, the Persian Empire. They fought, ag fought against him, but they were extremely effective against Alexander's forces. Uh, so Alexander goes, yoink, I'm taking these. The these are mine now. I want them. Uh, and uh, we're going to use them. And uses them against the the war elephants, trying to sort of soften up the elephants and trying to um, trying to make it so that the elephants became less effective in, in, in could be less effective in the battle because they were dangerous. They were extremely dangerous, uh, as you'll come to see later in the battle. Uh, but initially, so Alexander sends the horse archers forward. They harass the elephants. Doesn't necessarily work as well as Alexander had hoped, uh, but then he advances himself with the companion cavalry. And this is something that Alexander's men still would respect him for, is that he advanced himself. He was right in the middle of the fighting. He was always in the thick of the fighting. He was always leading the charges himself. He was always in the front line, uh, rather than sitting back and letting other people, you know, be in danger. He would always put himself in danger alongside his men, which is something they would still respect him for, for sure. Uh, so he charges... Um, on the um, on the uh, Peru Peru Peruvian left um, and made sure and sort of attacked and the companion cavalry obviously being more well better trained better equipped and better disciplined um, than their than, than their opponents in this battle they sort of quickly out out outclassed the um, cavalry the other cavalry on the other flank and Porus realizing what's happening goes. Oh crap! What do I do? Uh, and at this t at this time as well, the the phalanx is marching forward, and their spears had been elongated. Uh, the the Macedonian spears had been elongated to specifically fight elephants. Um, obviously, they knew that they would possibly be coming up against them. Um, they've come up against them before, but not in this not in this number. Um, but again, the elephants were still devastating to the phalanx, and th in fact, they were able to break their ranks, uh, and it took them. 
you know, a long time before they were able to get, uh, you know, a long time in battle, um, you know, time in sort of like a few minutes uh, up to as much as half an hour before they were able to get themselves back into formation and eventually crash into the Persian, uh, the Persian, uh, and eventually crash into the per Peruvian center. Um, but Porus again, realizes that the, the cavalry on his left is losing. They're going to be overrun, sort of goes to reinforce them. And this is what Alexander had been waiting for. He then sends the cavalry on the Persian, uh, on the Persian, on the, I've done it again, <laughs> on the Macedonian right, uh, that normally would have been commanded by Par Par Parmenian, but of course Parmenian's been executed by this time. Right, Parmenian. Uh, right, of course he, he, uh, so he sends the cavalry on the Persian. I've done it three times now. What the heck is wrong with me? Jeez. He, he sends the cavalry on the Macedonian right. Uh, so you do freaking five episodes on the Persians and it's, yeah. He sends the cavalry on the Macedonian right to, attack and sweep around uh, behind the uh, Peruvian line and sort of just annihilate them and encircle them, right? Uh, which is, again, a common ancient battle tactic that works, and it's common because it works. And this, this, is, what ha this is what happens is um, Porus's forces are surrounded, um, and they're, uh, eventually some of the infantry realize what's... Uh, some of the um, Peruvian infantry realize what's happening, and they try and flee, but little do they know the rest of Alexander's army has now crossed the river, so they're sort of even more encircled because Alexander's forces were growing by this time. Um, and the their forces are surrounded and a, and a slaughter begins. Uh, the elephants, in fact, turn and trample most of their infantry uh, themselves, so they turn and trample infantry. Like I said, they're extremely dangerous, both offensively and also if they, if you lose control of them, because they're they're wild animals. They're somewhat trained, but they're still like you know wild animals. They're not, they don't have the discipline that you know human soldiers have, and even human soldiers would lose discipline in a case uh, like this where you're you're going to lose. Uh, and you feel like you're in, a, you know, you're about to die, right? Most of the most of the casualties in a battle come once the battle's already lost. And Porus could see that the battle had been lost, but decided to fight on anyway because he didn't initially want to live under Persia, under Mas uh, Macedonian rule. Um, he didn't want to live in a world where Alexander had was king, at least initially. Uh, and then eventually he surrendered to protect his men. I was captured. And Alexander and Alexander stopped the, the slaughter, right? This is one of the things about Alexander that, as much as I, I sort of think he's, sometimes he acts like a brash, er, uh, arrogant fool and makes mistakes that I just, I, I don't, or makes decisions that, like, as a, as a person looking back on history, I go, why did you do this? Like, what's wrong with you? This is one of the times where, he, he you know, he's not one of those commanders that enjoyed, he enjoyed conquering, but not the bloodlust. Right, he didn't just kill people for no reason, as I said. Uh, so he stopped the the the, the death of um, the rest of the uh, Peruvians once once um, Porus had surrendered. And in fact, when he spoke to Porus after after the battle, Por he asked Porus, "How would you like to be treated?" And Porus said, "Treat me the way you'd uh, treat another king, right? I, one king to another. Treat me that way." And he says, "Okay." And, in fact, he uh, instilled Porus as the satrap of Punjab, which was the region of the Indian... Sun they're in the Punjab region of the Indian Sun continent, and he installed uh, Porus as the satrap of Punjab, realizing this guy is an... Ex you know, once, obviously, he'd sworn fealty to Alexander, and, you know, to protect his, for, to protect his, his people. And also, again, Alexander has this reputation for installing people who understand the local area in charge of the local area, right? He understands, hey, the Persians have to, um, like in Persia, he understood the Persians needed to like rule themselves sort of as long as they were loyal to me. And they understood that if they're not loyal to me, I will crush them. Same sort of thing here in the, in the Punjab region of the Indian sun, subcontinent uh, in India here. He very much was like, okay, I don't know this region. I don't plan on staying here very long, but I plan on, you know, extracting taxes and, money and resources um so i want someone who's going to be loyal to me but i also don't mind having a local person rule over the area so long as they're loyal to me and they understand that i will crush them if they're not loyal but poor as did uh and wanted to again protect his protect his men so he 
he um, or protect his people. So he agreed to the position, and that's that's sort of the end of the battle itself. And um, this is a very interesting period in history for uh, in Macedonian history and, and the history of Alexander as well, because it's at this point where Alexander. This whole podcast really has been about Alexander losing control slightly, right? He ever like the status quo had changed, right? He's he's lost his most uh, experienced and most trusted military advisor in Parminian because he's paranoid that people are trying to kill him. But again, he still shows that he himself is a, a competent military commander uh, without Parminian there. Um, as well uh and again there's questions about his the loyalty of his soldiers but then they go and they fight this new battle for him and they do follow him uh so th those questions are somewhat answered so there's cracks that are beginning to form and th that's sort of what the, the overall theme of this episode uh is is that there are cracks that are beginning to form uh in the macedonian line uh cracks that we will examine more closely next episode uh next week uh so thank you all very much for listening to this week's episode of the navigating history podcast i hope you found it informative and interesting and somewhat um you know somewhat fun and uh again uh one of the reasons i, I mainly do this is for people to have something to listen to on their monday morning commute uh so hopefully uh, hopefully this brightens up either your monday if you're listening to this on the month the following monday or uh, hopefully this brightens up your sunday um Either way, follow at Navigating History on um, Instagram at Navigating underscore History on TikTok and subscribe on YouTube at Navigating His uh, you know, on at, at Navigating History. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, click subscribe, click like, tell everybody about this video. Uh, if anyone you know likes history, uh, specifically ancient history, let them know about it. Uh, we upload every week, every Sunday, so there'll be a new episode next week as well. Uh, so thank you very much for watching and or listening, depending on where you're interacting with this, uh, either this video or listening on Spotify or any of the other platforms that we are available on. Um, again, we're available on Spotify, Google Podcasts, pretty much everywhere you get your podcasts, except for still Apple at this point. I'm still working on getting us uh, available there. Uh, but for now... Uh, thank you again very much for either watching or listening to this episode, and uh, I hope you have a great rest of your week, and uh, bye for now.